Volume Two, Chapter Twelve, Part Two of *The Mummy: A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. *The Mummy: A Tale of the Twenty-Second Century* by Jane Loudon, Volume Two, Chapter Twelve, Part Two. They now prepared to retire dragging the doctor with them totally heedless of his supplications for pardon and declarations of innocence they declared him to be a spy and swore that they would hang him as such as soon as they should get within the town the soldiers who were appointed to guard the doctor and who by indulging in a comfortable game at picket had neglected their charge now came up and dismayed at seeing the doctor in custody of a force too considerable for them to engage with fled to inform their sovereign trembling however all the time at the consequences of their disobedience when roderick and edric reached the plain the group of soldiers with the poor doctor in the midst of them were just entering one of the gates of the town through which they had made their sally the rays of the setting sun fell full upon the poor doctor's bald head and shining face and these in his white shirt-sleeves as he raised his hands in a supplicating manner towards heaven made him a conspicuous object even at a distance till he was hidden from the sight of his friends by the heavy gates closing upon him roderick and edric were in despair at the loss of their favourite indeed to see him dragged away so barbarously without having the power to assist him was enough to try the philosophy of a stoic it was no wonder therefore that it was too much for the patience of the irish hero who had barely known disappointment or control he raved stumped and unable to contain his rage ordered an instant attack of the place the enemy imagining the irish too much fatigued with the battle they had just fought to assault the town that night were far from expecting an attack but encouraged by the successful opposition they had before made they received the assault with firmness and repulsed it with vigour the cannon roared with tremendous fury on both sides and whole columns of men were swept away as grass falls before the scythe the impatience of roderick increased every moment and the discharge from a petard having set fire to the wooden bulwarks of the town he threw himself upon the blazing breach sword in hand heedless of the crackling timbers and fast-spreading flames whilst edric and some of his most devoted soldiers followed him and they all warmly engaged with the spaniards who opposed their entrance upon the walls a loud shout from below however soon excited their attention the besieged had made a sortie by means of the covered way and edric and his royal friend finding their retreat would be cut off if they stayed were reluctantly compelled to retire with their followers and roderick was struck down by a spanish soldier whilst in the act of leaping from the walls the soldier seeing the effect he had produced was about to repeat his blow and the irish hero must have perished before he could have recovered himself if edric had not interposed and received the gash instead of his friend then instantly turning around he cut down the soldier in the meantime roderick had revived and he and edric fought their way back to the rest of the army it was now getting quite dark and the besieged falling back within the town the army of the irish monarch returned once more to their camp how provoking cried roderick the moment they entered his tent taking off his helmet and giving it to alexis the greek page i shall never be happy again if they hurt the doctor take my sword also alexis but what is the matter with the boy methinks he looks wondrous pale does he not edric then turning to edric he was excessively shocked at the change in his appearance it has been before stated that edric received the blow the spanish soldier intended for roderick the wound had bled profusely but the blood having congealed the flow stopped and edric aided by his own courage presence of mind and firmness had been enabled to sustain himself till he reached the tent now however that the necessity for exertion had ceased his pallid looks and ghastly countenance bespoke what he suffered he had received one horrid gush upon the temple and the coagulated blood upon his face and hair contrasted frightfully with the whiteness of the rest of his face in fact he looked like the ghost of some poor murdered wretch appearing to implore vengeance upon his destroyer he seated himself at a table resting his arms upon it 
and supporting his head with his hands he attempted to smile in answer to roderick's inquiries but the effort was too much for his already exhausted strength and his head fell heavily upon the table roderick flew to support him and dispatched alexis for a surgeon my dear dear edric cried he speak to me for god's sake speak to me do not let me think that i have destroyed my friend oh edric tis roderick calls speak speak for god's sake speak edric was however incapable of speaking and the torture of the irish king when he found his friend could not answer him was beyond description my beloved edric exclaimed he wringing his hands in an agony of grief i implore you to answer me alas he cannot he is no more curses on my folly i might have been blessed and happy but in pursuit of the phantom glory i have sacrificed all i ever loved on earth oh would to god that i had never visited spain a heavy groan behind him startled roderick as he finished speaking and turning round he beheld alexis who had now returned with a surgeon the boy's appearance was singular his complexion was usually a clear dark brown with a rich glow of colour and remarkably full rosy lips now the deep colour on his cheeks remained unfaded but his lips had assumed a ghastly livid hue his limbs trembled with agitation and a dark mysterious expression seemed to sit upon his features roderick looked at him with amazement and almost horror as strange suspicions arose in his mind respecting him before the irish army had left cadiz it had been whispered that the duke of medina selina's claim to the throne was at least equal to that of the prince whom roderick was fighting to establish the duke indeed had many partisans but his age and blindness enfeebled their efforts an expert from cadiz had just brought intelligence that the duke was dead and as zoe was his sole heiress this extraordinary agitation in her page looked at least suspicious i must beware of him thought roderick regarding him attentively for as zoe knows that notwithstanding my obligations to her i shall never permit any monarch to reign in spain but don pedro whilst i live my life will be the first sacrifice required in her cause thus mused roderick though it was but for an instant that even the dread of personal danger could divert his thoughts from his friend the surgeon when he probed edric's wounds however declared to the great joy of the king that they were not dangerous and that he had only fainted from loss of blood he was now placed upon a couch in the same tent with that of the king and roderick soon after stretching his fur mantle under him threw himself upon his bed if not to sleep at least to muse upon the eventful occurrences of the day in the meantime dr and Werfen was forcibly dragged by the spanish soldiers towards a kind of town-hall in one of the principal squares of seville where on a platform or dais raised a little above the floor sat the sapient magistrates of the town when the prisoner was brought before them they all put on their spectacles and surveyed him attentively examining his bald head with the most scrupulous exactness here is the lamp of a spy said one and here that of a rog rejoined another yes the organs of observation and self-appropriation resumed the first are strongly developed that head is enough to hang an angel alas alas cried the poor doctor would to heaven that i had not lost my wig it would have been of no avail if you had retained it said one of the judges gravely as it would have been forcibly removed and even if you had worn your own hair you must have had your head shaved for knowing the general corruption and inaccuracy of witnesses the judges of this enlightened court reject verbal testimony altogether and form their correct and infallible judgments upon the sure and undeviating basis of that most profound and useful of all sciences craniology and happy are the prisoners judged by so wise a rule said another yes rejoined a third for though the minds of men are weak and their judgments liable to err the broad and general principles of science must ever remain unchangeably the same in this manner they went on whilst the poor doctor looking ruefully from one to another as they severally pronounced their opinions stood the very image of despair let us question him 
resumed the first magistrate. What were you doing when you were taken? I was making gunpowder, sighed Dr. Entwerfen. The wretch, exclaimed all his judges together. He acknowledges he was manufacturing weapons for our destruction. And how were you making this gunpowder? resumed the judge. I was boiling it, moaned the doctor. Boiling it, exclaimed the judges. What a villain! And they all shook their wise heads in concert. The poor doctor could not bear this, and throwing himself upon his knees, begged stoutly for mercy. In my opinion, said one, we should be guilty of a crime in letting him escape. I think so, too, cried another. I would not have such a scene upon my conscience for the world, exclaimed a third, whilst the unfortunate doctor, reading his condemnation in their countenances, groaned aloud in the agony of his spirit. At this moment the deep, awful roar of a cannon was heard, and Dr. Antwerfen leaped from his knees. "'Thank God! Thank God!' cried he, strutting up and down, and wiping his forehead with his pocket-handkerchief, as the continued roar of the cannon rolled awfully along, rebounding from house to house, and shaking the very cord in which they stood. The magistrates looked aghast, whilst their pallid lips and trembling limbs told that, however great they might be in the council, their courage was not particularly conspicuous in the field. The doctor, in the meantime, kept ejaculating, "'I'm safe! I'm safe! See what a thing it is to have a friend for a sovereign! No, no, what did I say? A sovereign for a friend, I mean! Ay, ay, that's it! That's it!' Thus did the doctor exult, whilst the citizens crowded round their chiefs, begging for directions, and not knowing whither to fly for safety. In this dilemma the exclamations of the doctor attracted their attention, and, enraged to see him rejoice at their misery, the magistrates ordered him to prison, whilst they consulted as to what steps it was most advisable to take. The poor doctor's joy was thus quickly changed to grief, and he lamented loudly his foolish transports of delight, without which he might perhaps have passed unnoticed in the crowd. It was too late, however, for repentance. The command had gone forth, and the unfortunate doctor was dragged away to a loathsome dungeon. The assault was, as we have seen, repulsed, and it being too late when it was over to think of hanging Dr. and Werfen that night, the magistrates retired to their beds, determined to have him executed the first thing in the morning. All was now still. The plain between the camp and the city, which had so lately echoed with the heavy tramp of horses and human beings, now slept tranquilly in the moonlight undisturbed save by the groans of some expiring wretch or by the busy labours of those employed to remove the dead and relieve the wounded roderick had thrown himself upon his couch and dozed but in a disturbed slumber whilst alexis placed at a table was writing dispatches from the dictation of don alvarez de ripada who had returned from the pursuit and sat opposite to him whilst lord arthur o'neill nodded at his side and Edric lay reclined on another couch at a little distance near the opening of the tent. All was silent, save the whispered voice of the Spanish general, the heavy breathing of Lord Arthur, and the measured steps of the sentinel as he paced his weary round. Edric listened till he grew tired of the same sounds, falling uninterruptedly upon his ear, and turning on his couch tried to divert his attention by gazing upon the objects before him. The strong light from the lamp placed upon the table fell upon the fine features of Alexis as he looked up to the Spaniard, and Edric thought, as he gazed upon them, that he had certainly seen those features before, though where he could not remember, and fatigued with the effort of trying to recollect, he turned to survey the noble Roderick as he lay gracefully stretched upon his couch. One arm was raised above his pillow, and the other fell carelessly by his side, whilst the fine contour of his head and neck was fully displayed the rich thick glossy curls which generally hid his forehead being thrown back his coral lips were half open and his long black eyelashes fringed his closed eyelids whilst his dark whiskers and moustachios with a rich brown tint that glowed upon his cheek contrasted finely with the whiteness of his throat god bless him thought Edric, and send him all the happiness he deserves. And then, seeming fearful to disturb him, he looked again towards the town. 
the curtain of the tent was partly looped up and edric watched with interest the lights of those still employed in their several duties of burying the dead and relieving the wounded the figures of the persons engaged in these painful duties were frequently imperceptible and the lights gliding to and fro apparently without any human means looked like ignis fatui or an assemblage of ghosts at their infernal revels edric sighed as he surveyed them and his thoughts flew back he knew not by what connection of ideas to his native land he thought of his father his brother of the good old duke of cornwall of rosabella and elvira till one by one the lights appeared to die away the images that floated before his fancy became gradually fainter and fainter his thoughts more confused the scene before him faded rapidly from his sight and in short he was fast sinking into repose when he was roused by a piercing scream and raising himself in his bed he beheld a spectacle which froze his blood with horror thick black pointed columns of smoke arose from the town through which glowed a livid redness and presently long spiral columns of flame burst through the smoke and uniting in one immense body of fire rose up to heaven and seemed to swallow up the devoted city the moment the flames broke forth one fearful scream seemed to burst from every lip the soldiers flew en masse to the tent of their monarch and roderick sprang from his couch when he heard their hurried footsteps what is the matter cried he rubbing his eyes and half blinded by the sudden glare of light the city is on fire exclaimed a thousand voices at once and roderick rushed forth upon the plain the air felt hot and scorching save them save the inhabitants cried roderick promise them a quarter piece anything to save them let all the soldiers fetch water from the river i will have no plunder he dies who touches an article belonging to the town or injures a single creature escaping from it let us fight like men it is beneath us to take advantage of misfortune the orders of roderick were as promptly obeyed as given the monarch himself leading the way to the town and assisting in endeavouring to quench the flames the gates were thrown open and men women and children rushed forth half naked and were received and supplied with food and shelter by the army of the irish hero the irish adored their sovereign his valour his rashness and his romantic generosity won their hearts and even his most discontented soldiers loved whilst they blamed him thus his will was law nay there was something so noble in his orders that his soldiers were proud of obeying them implicitly and not the meanest slave of the camp would have presumed to violate them in the slightest instance the flames had now caught some cotton mills on the river which had been spared in the previous conflagration and they burst forth in fresh volumes of fire as the light materials they contained added fuel to the flames the buildings in the town were mostly old many of them wood and some were large warehouses filled with the most combustible substances which burned with added fury as the long pointed flames lapped them into their devouring vortex curling round them and wrapping them in columns of fire as they one by one fell victims to their rage the town was soon nearly destroyed and the flames were fast approaching the citadel the governors of the city roused from their beds had taken refuge half naked in the camp of roderick but the prisoners yet remained in the citadel shut up however in dungeons below the surface of the earth roderick anxiously inquired of every one for doctor and werfen and at last to his infinite horror he learned he was in the fated citadel he rushed forward in agony to save him for he knew the powder was kept there but what pen shall describe his horror when he found that the flames had already seized their fortress and longer he could reach it a tremendous explosion took place a vast burst of fire rushed forth scattering red flaming furniture bricks pillars and every kind of rubbish in all directions and then all sank to comparative darkness the fire seemed to have pent its fury in that last effort and though it still feebly crept along in a half smothered flame its violence was past dreadful however was the scene that now presented itself for seville was levelled with the dust black disfigured smoky ruins supplied the place of what had once been lofty towers and sumptuous palaces 
the splendid cathedral which had withstood the rage of centuries was no more and human bodies lay in the streets thrown in fearful heaps some half burned and others blackened and dried by the scorching fury of the flames roderick stayed not to examine the effects of the fire he rushed over heaps of yet hot ashes and threw himself amongst the still smoking ruins of the citadel a spanish soldier whom he had saved from destruction a few minutes before was his guide and under his directions roderick hastened to the dungeons he hurried from one to the other releasing the unhappy wretches confined there and searching everywhere for the doctor but in vain at last he heard his well-known voice the dungeon door was thick but it could not resist the impatience of roderick he could not wait for the soldier to assist him to open it he burst the fastenings asunder and in an instant the poor doctor sobbing with joy was locked in the monarch's arms some of the soldiers of roderick had followed him to the citadel and he left it to them and the spaniard to release the other prisoners whilst he returned with his dear doctor in triumph back to the camp End of chapter twelve part two of volume two and of the second volume